William Barclay says that according to history, in Jesus' day, men did not measure their age by the number of years they had lived. They measured their age by the number of wives they had. A man wouldn't say, I'm 55 years old. He'd say, I'm 15 wives old. Bragged about the number of times he had been married and divorced. So your age was defined by how many women you could go through and get rid of and get new ones. A Jewish woman had absolutely no right of divorce. He could divorce her for any reason. They came to Jesus in Matthew 19 and said, Can a man put away his wife for every cause? She burnt the toast. She don't smile. She don't make me happy. It didn't matter what the reason was. He could send her home for any reason. And she had no recourse. There was nothing she could do about it. That woman had been thrown away by five men who said she's not worth living with. And they sent her back. And dad had to find another man and pay him money called a dowry to take her. And when that one decided he didn't want her and sent her back, he had to find the third man. When that one didn't want her, he found the fourth man. When that one didn't want her, he found the fifth man. And it's quite obvious by number six, he's not alive anymore. There's no one to find someone for her to live with. So she's living with a man, not because she chooses, but she has no other options in life. Now, it's a possibility that an older sibling gave her away, but there's not a father involved, so it can't be a marriage. So here's this woman at Jacob's well. Sitting on Jacob's well, if you just look to the north, you could see a monumental structure that was built as a result of crossing Jordan River. Just less than 300 yards to the north of this well that Jesus is sitting in is Mount Ebal. And at the bottom of Mount Ebal are 12 stones from the Jordan River. And plastered on the side of that mountain are rocks that were cemented in place and the law was etched on the side of that mountain. When Israel comes back from Egypt, Moses sends them to this place and the Israelites are divided into two companies, half of the tribes on one side, the other half on the other side. On one side, the tribes stand on the side of Mount Gerizim. The other stands on the side of Mount Ebal. And they pronounce the blessings and the curses of what happens in their lives if they don't follow the law. If they follow the plan of God, here's all the blessings. You're going to be blessed in your home. You're going to be blessed in the way. You'll be blessed as you go. You'll be blessed in your job. You'll be blessed. And all of the blessings are, are, are spelled out. And they shouted those two things between the mountains. So he shows up at this well. And here is this woman coming to get water. Now, apparently her city rejected her and would not allow her to draw water from the well in town. So she has to come to Jacob's well. Now, Jacob's well is a hole about 10 foot in diameter, and it's about 150 to 200 feet deep. It's, it's cut through rock. It never reached a source of water. It didn't reach an underground water level. It was just a hole. And it got its water from the farmer and latter rains. And when the spring rains come, the water coming down off the mountains would flow into the well and would fill it up. And over time, water that could leach out through the rock would continue to fill it up. But because it had no flowing water, it was stagnant. And anybody that drank out of it 
would get diseased. The only way you could drink water from this well is to boil it. And if you didn't boil it and kill the germs that were in it, you'd get disease from it. So here's this woman who's forced to come and drink. Now, for this encounter to take place, Jesus had to send 12 men to town to buy lunch. Now, when did it ever take 12 men to buy lunch? He sent all of the disciples into town so he could be alone with this woman when she approached. Why? Because he knew if those 12 men were there, she would never have a conversation with him because those men would intimidate her and, and make her feel worthless. First of all, she's a Samaritan. Now, we say that the Samaritans are half-breed, but that's really not true. The Samaritans happened as a result of Assyria capturing northern tribes and taking them out of the country and bringing in people from Assyria and making them live in that area. So they're transplanted Assyrians into Israel. When they got there, there were still a few Jewish people there, and they got to hearing about the Jewish law and the Jewish religion, and they got intrigued and decided they would rather serve the Jewish God than the Assyrian God. And so they became proselytes. Now, after the first generation of a proselyte, they're considered a Jew. The original tabernacle was erected on Mount Gerizim. It's also called Shiloh. They worshiped according to the law. Israel worshiped according to the rabbis. They didn't even worship according to the law. They worshiped according to rabbis. So this woman shows up because Jesus needs to have a conversation with her. And he, he knows that she's the one who will receive his message. And so here she comes. And he says, give me the drink. Now, how is it that this lady recognized who he was, that he's a Jew and a rabbi? How did she know that? Because of his dress. His clothing identified the fact he was a Jew and a rabbi, a teacher. And she says, why are you asking me? If she thinks he's going to try to say something rude to her or humiliate her. And so she instantly is defensive. Why are you saying to me, give me the drink? First of all, I am a woman. Secondly, I am a Samaritan. Why would you even approach me? And Jesus said to her, woman. That is the highest term of endearment in the Greek language. He didn't disrespect her. He, he put her on a pedestal. And he said, ma'am, if you just understood who I am, you would ask of me and I would give you water to drink, and you would never, I would give you the gift of God. That word gift is doria. In the Greek language, there's seven or eight different words for gift. There's doria, doron, charis, chara, charisma. These are all Greek words for gift. Doron is a gift that is produced by sacrifice. If you give someone a gift, it's going to cost you. You're going to have to spend time making it, or you're going to have to go to work and make money and buy it. Now, whatever you do to give it to somebody, you're going to have to pay money to give it away. That's a doro. A doria is a gift that can only be used in describing God. It is a gift from deity to humanity. Man cannot give this gift to God. 
Only God can give this gift to man. And she said, he said to her, if you knew who I was, you would ask of me and I would give you this gift and you would never thirst again. Now, according to grammar, this word is called epexgetical. And that's just a fancy term to say it can be replaced by another word. They're, they're the same word. If you say one, you can mean the other. If you say the other, you, you can replace. They're interchangeable. And the other word that you can use is Holy Ghost. So the word gift, doria, and the word Holy Ghost are synonymous. And you can interchange. So when you, when he spoke to her and said, if you knew who I was, I'm going to give you a gift called the Holy Ghost. And if you ever drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. And she said, I want to drink it. Instantly, I, I, I don't want to come back to this well and get water anymore. Give me to drink. Whatever it is, I'm ready to receive it. And then a conversation starts. And she, Jesus says, okay, before you drink, though, you know, need to go get your husband. And she said, I don't have one. And he said, no, you've had five. And the one you're living with now is not your husband. Instantly, she recognized he's more than a rabbi. And she says, I perceive you are a prophet. And we know that Messiah comes. Are you him? And his response was, Ego ami soi lelon, which literally translates, I am that I am is speaking to thee. She asked to see the Messiah. He said, no, you think the Messiah is a man, but Jehovah of the Old Testament is standing in your presence. And Jehovah is speaking to you, and Jehovah has a gift to offer you. For Peter to preach Acts 2.38, Jesus forced him to interview this woman. The only other time the word Doria is used in the New Testament before Acts 2.38 is John chapter 4. When Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost and declares, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and you shall receive the gift, the doria of the Holy Ghost. The only way he could quote that and say that is to have had an interview with this woman. Jesus talked to it a well. See, men of that day thought women were worthless. And Jesus had to, had to teach these 12 men that the bride is a female. And you better not treat her with, with any kind of disrespect. you got to treat her with dignity and respect because she's going to be my bride. Right now, we're just a spouse to him. And let me point out, he, he's just, God's not immoral. He's not making love to his bride that he hadn't married yet. You better be very careful about saying make 